Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this special event. Uh, I'm Fran Barry, and I'm the publisher at Welcome Collection. And I'm to give a really brief audio description of myself. Um, I'm a white woman in glasses with brown hair up in a bun. We're really thrilled to have Gavin Francis, Sam Gudiani, and Javi Carell here tonight to explore the subject of recovery, self-care, hope, and healing, um, particularly right now in the depths of January and at a time when the subject feels particularly needed. For those of you new to Welcome Collection, uh, we're a free museum and library in London that explores health, making connections across science, medicine, life and art. Um, we've been shut for a few weeks, but we'll be reopening next Tuesday. So please do come and visit um, if you can, or you can check out our work online too. Um, Welcome Collection Books. We work with the leading indie publisher Profile um, to publish thought-provoking non-fiction that illuminates health and being human. And we were really delighted to publish Gavin's short but powerful wise book, Recovery, last week. Um, that will be the jumping off point for this discussion tonight. So Gavin is a GP and an acclaimed author um, and Recovery draws on all his rich experiences and insights to look at the many shapes Recovery takes and the challenges of making space for it in our modern busy lives. It's already had rave reviews from Michael Rosen, Rachel Clark and Henry Marsh. And um, I'll stop there because I know Sam is going to give a fuller introduction to Gavin and Harvey tonight. So it's a real pleasure to introduce our facilitator for tonight, Sam Gugliani. Sam is a consultant oncologist in Cheltenham, specialising in the management of lung and brain tumours. He's director of the festival Medicine Unboxed, which illuminates the challenges and wonders of medicine through the arts. He's a poet, writes The Lancet, and his novel Histories was published in 2017. Um, Sam, I'll hand over to you now, and I really hope you'll enjoy the event. Thanks very much, Fran. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight, and thanks so much for joining myself, GP and author Gavin Francis, and philosopher Javi Corral, to discuss our perspectives on recovery. My name's Sam Guglani, and I'm chairing the conversation I'll start with a brief audio description of myself for anyone who'd find it helpful. I'm a tired looking doctor in a relatively shabby NHS office, fading Indian skin, but apparently the best brown eyes in Cheltenham. Tonight's event then is inspired by Gavin's, in my view, really extraordinary and important new book, Recovery, The Lost Art of Convalescence. And over the next hour, Gavin, Harvey and myself will be discussing our personal and professional experiences of illness, healing, and the idea and importance of convalescence. And we'll be taking questions from you during the last 15 minutes of that hour. It's genuinely a privilege for me to be speaking to Gavin and Harvey tonight. They're both bright sources of inspiration for me personally. So uh, it's good to be talking to them. Um, briefly, the event will be recorded and it'll be available to watch again on Welcome's YouTube channel. Your cameras and microphones will be off, but you'll be able to see and hear us. We have live speech to text provided by Voicebox and you can access the captions link shared in the chat box now as they'll be opening up in a separate window. The event is British Sign Language Interpreted and Michelle and Russell here will be interpreting a discussion into BSL for you. We'll also be audio describing the event as we have. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Gavin first for five minutes, then Harvey for another five minutes before opening up into the conversation. We'll want to hear from you throughout, so you can chat, comment and ask questions for the Q&A in the YouTube chat if you're signed in. And remember, all your questions will be available in the public domain, so please you know, behave respectfully and professionally on that platform. You can also ask questions and comment uh, without signing in via Slido. Um, on to our conversation then. Um, and we're going to start with uh, five or six minutes from um, Gavin. So Gavin Francis has worked really across the world as a surgeon, an emergency physician, a medical officer with the British Antarctic Survey, and presently as a GP. He's the award-winning author of a number of books and also writes for The Guardian, The Times, The London Review of Books and Granter. Gavin Francis, over to you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Fran, and, uh, and Harvey for joining us tonight. So um, beginning my very short presentation in a similar way to Sam and Fran, if anybody's visually impaired. I'm a, a middle-aged Scotsman with short dark hair wearing a pink shirt and behind me is a yellow wall with lots of framed maps of very beloved islands from uh, all taken from one of my books. And I'm going to speak just for five or six minutes about the themes of this book and um, recovery and why it is that I wrote it. So 
It's a book about illness and recovery. It's about healing and convalescence. And although I've written quite a few books, as Sam mentioned, about um, travel and about medicine, um, I'd never really tackled a subject like this one so directly um, about just purely about the act of consultations and about the information exchange that, that, that happens in those kinds of consultations. I've always wanted to weave personal experience with different kinds of medical authorities and different kinds of scientific research and all patient stories in it are, are very much anonymized. Um, and I wrote it really because I've spent so much of the last two years of this terrible pandemic speaking to people about recovery, not just from COVID, but about the damaging effects of the repeated lockdowns. People have had to recover from all sorts of things in the last couple of years, not least, of course, um, bereavement. And why the subtitle, The Lost Art of Convalescence? I mean, it's my own view that um, we really have lost as a society, as, as a community, the community in which I practice, a lot of the wisdom of convalescence that uh, we used to hold as a society and as a community. My, my view is that in the 1950s and 1960s, I think with the advent of steroids, of antibiotics, of good inhalers, of effective antidepressants, older ideas about the importance of environment, of rest, of diet, and, and so on, um, began to melt away. So we used to know and accept, for example, that good nursing was vital for convalescence. Uh, we used to know that it was important to give time to it, but with increasing emphasis on glamorous technical fixes, on new drugs, on fancy surgical procedures, I think people began to think all you needed was the right prescription. You know, if you look at the textbooks from which I learned medicine and which Sam learned medicine, the words uh, recovery or convalescence don't really come up in the index because our own tutors tended to have the opinion that once you got a patient over the crisis of an illness, the body just finds ways um, to, to heal itself. But after 15, 20 years of practicing medicine, I've found the reverse is often the case. You know, the environment is very important. You know, we need space, we need light, we need quiet, greenery, cleanliness, all those things that Florence Nightingale so valued. We need a nutritious diet. Travel can help. Um, the fact that ideas and expectations of illness are as powerful as drugs and poisons, so we have to be very careful who we listen to because our expectations are so important. And we need to learn a new language of the body and listen to it with respect. I often encourage people to trust their own instincts about what they're capable of doing and not doing and try to remember that health can never really be a final destination for anyone. It's always a balance. Um, so Western medicine is, is really very, very powerful. It's been adopted in one way or another in most parts of the world, which isn't true of all other medical traditions. And that tells us, I think, something about its power. It's got a great power to name and classify illness. Um, and that can reassure us sometimes that our illness has an existence separate from ourselves. And also that amazing power of medicine just to name illness can offer us access to a community of others. But it's worth remembering that Western medicine, in my view, actually can cure very little. I mean, it's very good at mitigating illness, palliating illness, helping with symptoms. For those of my patients with terminal illness or incurable conditions, I still think about recovery in the sense of it being possible to build towards a life of greater autonomy, dignity, building in achievable goals, uh, with my patients and I look forward to hearing more from Javi's approach in this. She's got wonderful helpful perspectives on living with illness or living wellness within illness. Um, I think comparisons between people are all deadly. It's so tempting to resent people who seem to get quicker, get better quicker than us or to despair at how we're coping with illness when we see others and how well they're coping but my own view is comparisons are hardly ever helpful. And another theme that I'd like to talk about if we get time is that it's good to remember that doctors and nurses are human beings and it's my firm conviction that the very best doctors and nurses are those that manage to gauge in the space of a short encounter what sort of 
clinician each patient needs. I mean, I have some patients who see me purely as a conduit to get access to specialists. I have some that see me as a shoulder to cry on. I have some who see me as a representative of the scientific medical establishment. And to treat those patients effectively, I believe it's necessary to find a way to intuit the best approach for them. And I've had some wonderful mentors over the years that have helped me do that. So just to conclude, really, I mean, I think we have the opportunity now as a society coming out of this pandemic to think about convalescence differently. We need to blend the achievements of modern medicine with older approaches that had a great deal of wisdom to them. And this book explores some of the ways we might try to do that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, so Javi Carell is a professor of philosophy at the University of Bristol, and she recently completed a Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator Award for the life of breath. Javi's the author, amongst other books, of illness, shortlisted for the Wellcome Trust Book Prize, pretty much every line of which I've underlined. She was selected as a Best of Bristol lecturer in 2016. Over to you, Javi. Thank you so much, Sam and Gavin. Um, um, really privileged to join this conversation and to the to the welcome natalie um i so so here's the book sorry don't know if i'm wait there you go there's the book um and it, it was it was a joy to read gavin and i would say in the first um my kind of um maybe impulsive response having just finished the last pages is that it's a book that makes you feel really cared for um, and that is a, a equality in in physicians and healthcare professionals that is, I think, quite hard to teach um, and very, very valuable. So if you get to the end of the book, um, Gavin gives us a list of sort of advice of the sort that uh, a parent might give a child heading out on a cold winter night, you know, sort of take a jumper, look after yourself, eat well. Don't talk to strangers. Don't come back on your own. It's it's a really lovely tone, Gavin, and it shows, I think, the enormous amount of, of care and compassion that you know you um, instill into this this work of uh, of doctoring, and which I think very much chimes what, with what you were saying about um, having the technology, having um, you know medications and new treatments to throw at a condition but ultimately what we're doing a lot of the time is managing not curing supporting not resolving um extending and not offering you know blissful immortality so to speak so um as someone who has been living with a chronic uh, lung condition um in case you're curious, it's a very rare lung disease that affects women in their childbearing years called uh, no less than lymphangiomyomatosis or LAM for short. Um, now, I've lived with that for a very long time. It's restricted my life enormously. Um, and I think for me, the art of recovery wasn't the art of recovering lung function because that wasn't going to happen, but it was the art of recovering wellness within the context of a chronic illness. Um, it might sound like a slogan, but I think it's much more than that. I think it's a recipe, if you like, for opening up existential considerations and reflections of the sort that you would find in what I call skillful coping or reflective coping. And by reflective coping, I mean, you don't treat your ill health as uh, some catastrophe that's descended upon you and you're this kind of passive recipient of it. It becomes part of your life. It becomes part of who you are and how you live and how you come across. And it becomes, I think, one more component of a life that is you know, complex and rich in a multitude of ways. And I think that's precisely the non-reducibility of personhood that comes across in, in Gavin's book, that recovery isn't just 
mechanical, um, you know, imposed rest, for example, or a certain diet or uh, um, sleeping a lot. Uh, it is really a creative work of recovering something that has been lost. That thing that has been lost is not necessarily good health, but the thing that has been lost is the sense of wellness or the sense of wholeness, if you like, that I think is recoverable even if the good health uh, or the state of not being diseased is, is not recoverable. So I guess um, what I want to do is offer my enthusiastic support to everything Gavin writes in the books and, in, and the things he's, he's said now. I'll uh, offer two more thoughts before I um, uh, hand back to, to Sam. The first is, um, I think there's an interesting theme about time when we think about recovery. So um, I think this comes up in the book quite a few times, Gavin, you talk about people being impatient and wanting to recover and wanting to go back to full activity and being annoyed and frustrated at the length of time that it takes. And I think that's entirely true. And it's really a continuation of the frustration of the, um, you know, sort of chunks of time that you can call waiting time that are demanded of you as a, as a patient. So I think there's a real um, maybe discrepancy between the health professional who's always very short on time, as I'm sure you and Sam can attest to, the real sense that, you know, oh, you're forever behind, there's always paperwork, so there's more patients to see and tests to order and things to oversee and the days are so long. And between the time of the patient who is impatient because they want to go home, they want to already be recovered, they want to finish with it as it were, but are stuck with a lot of waiting. And I'm thinking about this space of waiting as something that's really fundamental to the work of recovery as you were putting it, Gavin, because what you, I think, are inviting people to do is to move away from this frustrating, you know, sitting in the waiting room and counting the minutes um, to a form of being in the present that enables you to let go of that very stressful perspective and to um, be more in tune, you know, with your body, with the space around you, with time and so on. Um, and I'll add a final, uh, a final thought, which is about um, what it is to recover. So again, I think maybe in the kind of uh, general imagination, we think of it as something quite passive. But actually, um, again, as I think Gavin writes about very eloquently, eloquently in the end of the book, it is really hard work. It takes a lot for somebody who's eaten a rubbish diet for a long time to eat their five a day, or for somebody who um, is recovering from pneumonia or chest infection to get back on the treadmill and walk a couple of miles. So I think the maybe general imagination, the recovery, the, some person sort of recli reclining on a chaise longue and, uh, you know, sipping tea is very much removed from uh, the kinds of very active types of recovery that I'm, I'm thinking about here, rehabilitation, recovering the muscle strength after a period of uh, uh, being bedridden, recovering lung function after um, a uh, lung collapse or, or chest infection, recovering strength and vitality in general, I think, is a very active and very demanding process. And it's demanding physically and emotionally, but it's also demanding morally. And I'm happy to say more about that later. Thank you. Thank you very much. So both, I just wondered if we could start by um, thinking a bit about how both of you really, to my mind, challenge the concepts and therefore the language and words that we attach to the entire continuum between health, illness and recovery. And it seems to me that both of you make distinctions between illness and disease in your books. 
Could you say a bit about that, starting, Gavin, perhaps with you and what you say about how influential culture, the culture we inhabit is in our experience of illness? Mm. Yes, it's um, something that struck me again and again in that dialogue that opens up between a clinician and the patient when you're sort of tentatively starting to get to know one another is how important it is to explore with a patient if you can get the time what their own view of their illness or their incapacity is you know their that famous line what do you understand of your own condition that we ask and also what does it stop you from doing that you would like to do and um and I've just seen over the years, the most one of the wonderful things about medicine is just that it throws you into this traffic and dialogue with people from all ends of life, you know, rich and poor, young and old, um, educated, uneducated, everybody. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful mix it throws you into. And, and I've been really struck over the years by how some people's lives can be utterly devastated for years by something that another patient might find quite trivial and other people can be can live with the most astonishing um disabilities and indignities seemingly with uh, with kind of aplomb and and I spend my life trying to sort of figure out the secrets of the ones who seem to have managed to live well with illness um, but yes, culture, expectations, the way you've been brought up, the way often we learn about our illness behaviour when we're children, um, the way our own society around us tells us to respond or react when we're ill, all these things have got massive, massive impact on how we respond to illness. And so um, I, I wish I had an easy formula for how on encountering a new patient um, I try to figure out their worldview from the point of view of that cultural conditioning. Um, but it's a really interesting conversation to get into with them. And, and it's one that you can't really avoid if you're going to be effective. Thanks, Gavin. And, 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 and Harvey, you take that, you take that um, baton further by, by, so we will, I'm conscious that very often, say on a ward round, words like disease and illness is, illness are traded as similar identical even but you talk about needing really to to um think about and try to understand another person's subjective very fundamental distinction i think it um it upsets me a lot when people use them interchangeably um so the term disease, I think, is very useful in order to denote physiological dysfunction. Um, I don't know, a brain lesion, um, a faulty heart valve, uh, a sprained ankle. Um, illness is the lived experience of the disease. And what it helps us, what the distinction helps us do is recover the sense that there is a person there. I mean, of course, all health professionals know there is a person, but the some of the biomedical treatments are, well, not some, all of them are extremely focused on treating the physiological dysfunction. And within all that, um, and I'd be interested actually to hear your thoughts as a GP and an oncologist, um, you want to have a very, very uh very strong very salient sense that there is there is a person anchoring all that there is a person living that body whose uh illness experience you want to acknowledge and you want to value and you want to factor in and we really struggle i think for example trying to synthesize qualitative uh and quantitative uh data when when we're trying to do things like right nice guidelines or um, or develop treatment protocols or give accounts of what particular diseases are like. So I think it's a it's a useful distinction because it brings the person back to the to the center and it, because it also shows us maybe more philosophically that we're these really weird creatures made of matter that obeys the laws of physics, chemistry, physiology, biology. Um, but we're also these 
these sentient creatures who are conscious of the, this, the, this disease going on in their bodies. Thank you. And because of that, because of that um, subjectivity of illness, it is also utterly universal to human experience. It isn't something that happens to other people. This is the stuff of us, isn't it? And both of you comment on this, Harvey, on its universality. And Gavin, then also the fact that health, illness, and therefore also recovery implicit to both are constantly in a in a fine balance, it, it, rather than the very easily arrived at conceptions of being extremes, I'm well, I'm unwell, actually they're constantly almost homeostatically balanced. Um, I wondered if you could both say something about that, Gavin, beginning with you and that how you feel it's important to view them in balance and then therefore their universality to all of our lives. Yeah, of course. Uh, could I just check, uh, Sam, that you're actually seeing my video because my video scrambled here. I can see it. Point of view? Yeah, we can see it here. Oh, fine. Mine is all scrambled. Anyway, um, so there's this fa very famous definition of health from the World Health Organization that, that health is essentially a total absence of any kind of infirmity, suffering, disease, any ailment whatsoever. And the WHO definition of health has always seemed to me quite extraordinarily unreachable. You know, it seems to me that, that nobody would ever be in a state of total physical and mental well-being as described by that founding statement. And um, whether they're a newborn baby or whether they're um, lying on their deathbed. And it just seems to me so obvious that health must be a very precarious balancing between lots of different possibilities that are open to us. You know, as as was just mentioned, you know, we're, we're kind of odd fleshy beings. So many different kinds of processes have to be just, just so to keep the homeostasis of our cells going. Um, so... I always, I always like to think about that the the health as being a mean between these kinds of extremes. You know, of course, it's good to be fit and healthy. It's good for your heart to be fit and run, for example, every so often. But we know that that elite athletes develop problems with their heart. You know, they they get kind of cardiomyopathy. They get thickening of the heart muscle that becomes pathological. It's good to be not too overweight, but if we get too slim, then it's terrible for our health. It's really um, doesn't work. And so health just seems to me very obviously as a, a balance. And what I wanted to bring out in this book is, is to almost resurrect with the help of a wonderful uh, Californian physician called Victoria Sweet, this old medieval concept of health as being a balance between the humours. Now, we don't, we, of course, we don't believe in the humours anymore. Although they dominated medicine for 2,000 years, we don't think about the body that way. But still, the old-fashioned humoral approach to medicine did hold at its centre the idea that we had to balance extremes, hot and cold, wet and dry. And, um, and when I'm facing a patient, with a, particularly with a very kind of difficult chronic illness, or I'm trying to think about how best somebody might flourish with an illness, those are concepts that I think are very important to hold on to and to try to explore with them. That, that health for them is just a different kind of balance that we've got to try and achieve with the circumstances that are that are presented to us. Thanks, Gavin. Harvey? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's really interesting and useful and you know very much in line with you know Aristotle's idea of the, the golden mean. You know, saying if you if you're too too uh, you know um, rash and you spend your money too quickly, that's not good. If you're a complete miser, that's not good either. There'll be uh, a virtue in the middle, in between these two extremes, which would be the virtue of generosity, for example. So that that seems to tie in with with that theme. Um, I wanted to just throw in uh, one more notion of of balance, and that's really the idea of, um, of treatment. So um, I think, is, is it, I'm pretty sure it's in the book, but forgive me if not, Gavin, there was this idea uh, saying, you're much more, a doctor is much more like a gardener than a, a plumber or a car mechanic. And I think sometimes people really like this idea of the car mechanic because you'll just, you'll open the hood, you'll take out the faulty bit, you'll pull in a new one and off you go, you're all fixed. 
And of course, it's not like that. And so often people say, oh, um, well, if your lungs aren't working, why don't you just have a transplant? Uh, and as you probably well know, you don't just have a transplant. There is a huge price to pay and risks and associated complications with that. And so um, to me, what's always infinitely exciting um, is that in your job, your problem solvers of problem upon problem upon problem that accumulate <clears throat> when people have, say, chronic ill health. You can't say, here's all the painkiller you want, knock yourself out, because you might die. You can't say, well, uh, the chemo is really effective. Let's triple the dose so we can kill all the cancer cells more quickly. Um, so there's a real sense that you're somehow tethered to, to this really, the, these, this homeostatic point of various bodily functions. And you have to be you know, very gentle, very delicate, very fine-tuned to not mess those up. And I think that's an in interesting challenge for you as, as physicians, I suppose, that struck me as also being a form of engaging with homeostasis. Alongside, um, you know, finding some of the words like recovery not prevalent in medical textbooks, I guess, other ones that you don't necessarily come across are words that are um, words like fear and hope, which are, are central to uh, the experience of illness and indeed um, healthcare professionals encounter with illness. And I, both of you appear to arrive at similar ideas of gratitude, almost generosity. You just said, Harvey, but gratitude. Um, Kevin, you use the word epiphanies of gratitude, the phrase epiphanies of gratitude, which I loved, as um, places from which to meet the losses and, and fears um, of illness. I just wondered if you both might say a bit about um, why you arrive at that and how you see gratitude. Harvey, you use the phrase of being healthy within illness and focus on gratitude within the present moment. Is this, if I may, easily said, um, but hard to actually um, meaningfully inhabit? Or have you got um, advice for us fragile beings as to how well we can find that gratitude as a counterbalance to you know, the weathering of life, I guess? If that's not too long a question, it might be. I would like to hear Javi talk about her experience of finding gratitude within the, the sort of tempestuous experience of her illness. You know, Javi Javi's written a beautiful book called Illness, and, um, and in it she describes her life being like a tempestuous series of rapids. Um, the river of her life has just become very turbulent. Um, and yeah, I would like to hear if Javi feels able to talk to that. I would like to hear a bit about that. Yeah, I think I think the difference, the really crucial difference, is um, maybe in, in two things. I mean, the first is that you think people, again the, the most common response I've had is people saying, "Well, nobody knows when they're going to buy you die. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow." And I think that's true, but it's also not true because the the chances of that happening are extremely low. Whereas I think once you're ill with a you know serious chronic condition, um, you hedge your bets quite differently. Um, so you you live your life, I think, in a in a different way because you have this really very um, deeply embedded sense that it's not going to be a long, gentle, flowing river into, into infinity. It's really limited, and it's limited in both the temporal sense. You know, death is, you know, could come, come knocking at any, any moment, but also in the sense of that our possibilities are finite. And that, to me, is the thing that I find the most frustrating of having a lung condition, is you keep thinking, I wish I could do this, and I wish I could do that. Now, what happens, the, the second difference I want to point to is that between 
uh, periods where the disease is progressing. So the lung function is declining quickly or there's a big chest infection. And after that, you don't regain the lung function you had before. Um, and between the, those periods of stability, and I think that stability is crucial. So it's not enough if you have food and water and shelter today. You also have to have the confidence that you will also have them tomorrow in order to have peace of mind today. So there is something about stability that within the context of chronic illness can give you that peace of mind. So you don't think, I wish I didn't have this or I wish I could make it all go away. You stop. Those, those are very salient fantasies, but you, you, you drop them after a while. But you're still, um, you, you're still nurturing this, this quiet hope that long may it last. I just want to be stable. I, I want no news. I want my lung function this time to be exactly like it was last time. Not, not, not better, just the same. So I think, um, if anything, I would speak in, in praise of stability and say that that wellness, in order to cultivate it, has to be anchored in stability. If things are changing all the time, if you're coming in and out of hospital, if you have new symptoms or disease progression or exacerbations, it throws everything into the air. So the, the possibility of wellness within the context of illness, I think is very much tied to that stability. Thanks, Harvey. But of course, before I come on to Gavin, stability isn't, I guess, the norm um, for um, necessarily everyone in it who, who is unwell. Are, are you saying that, that, that those moments of wellness be they graced with gratitude or not, are untenable if things are very um, turbulent or still findable? Well, I think it's a different kind of moral demand on you. Um, and to go back to what I was saying before is I think um, people who are very ill are often required to show a lot of courage uh, much more than you would in normal circumstances. And by normal circumstance, I'm including the, you know, somebody who's chronically ill, but, but stable. Um, I think it's a really unique situation to, um, to live through. And I think living through it alone is, is, is probably my biggest dread. And I think we have to think a lot more about how, and again, this is another thing from Gavin's book, how we are dependent on others, how we can give to others, how we can be with others at times when, you know, the boat is seriously rocked. And um, yeah, and that, and it's, it's very hard to find peace, wellness, gratitude. Thanks, Zoe. Gavin? I think I've probably got a couple of points or explorations to add on to that. One is just about the nature of dynamism, that our lives are dynamic anyway, constantly. Illness is dynamic, physiology is dynamic, the progression of our lives is dynamic. None of us are getting any younger. And um, the, there's something to be said or to reassure often in the consultations I have with patients about that change, you know, to reassure that, that um, even sometimes change in the wrong direction shows that things are changing and that in itself can be a source, bizarrely, paradoxically, of hope that, that things aren't stuck. And I've often had consultations with patients that are struggling with chronic illness or struggling with a, um, a very difficult post-viral fatigue that, that is reassuring them that when they are able to um, feel their body responding and reacting to the different demands they place upon it, then that in itself is a reassurance that their body is still responding and changing. So dynamism is one thing that I think is worth emphasizing, that, that any vision of the body that's static at its heart is ultimately an illusion. And, um, and that often manifests itself, of course, with recovery from post-viral fatigues and this kind of snakes and ladders syndrome where people feel that they're doing really well and they sort of get a few ladders boosted up towards the top of the board, but then so some setback um, can make me feel as if you're just slid all the way down the snakes back to the beginning of the board. Um, 
But with every movement up and down the board, we, we learn something and we gather experience that might help us next time um, avoid those kinds of triggers. And the other thing is just to touch on, um, and I would love to ask you about this, Sam, as an oncologist, um, is this idea that really good medicine or the best medicine is one that is personalised to the patient, not in the sense of, uh, you know, the personalised medicine we hear about now according to your DNA, but according to what kind of patient you are. You know, we we were just talking, Javi was just mentioning that some people like to see the body as like almost like a machine and you should be able to just swap out the part. And um, I know I've heard uh, cardiologists and now oncologists too joking about the fact that engineers are the most difficult people to look after because they sometimes have an extremely mechanistic view of the body and um, and that can be quite difficult to reconcile with reality. Um, you know, the, the learning the physiology of medicine, learning the kind of therapeutics of medicine, um, from my position as a generalist in general practice, that has never been the hardest part of medicine. It's quite a small part. The really hard part of medicine is figuring out what kind of patient what kind of doctor or nurse clinician each patient needs. Do they need somebody that takes a very mechanistic engineering approach? Do they need somebody that takes a very gentle collaborative approach? Do they need somebody that blinds them with science? So those are the kinds of things that, that really good clinicians try and feel out early in an encounter with a patient to try and figure out what is going to be the way I can best convince this patient of the way forward for them. And the last very, very brief point is just, um, um, we talked about, I would love to um, just emphasize mm -hmm. Harvey's point about what are the possibilities. You know, Christopher Ward, the rehab physician who's done events with Harvey and whose book, um, I quote approvingly and wonderfully in, the, in, in this little book of recovery, he, he speaks to his new patients in rehab medicine about this concept of possibilitation rather than rehabilitation. What are the possibilities that are open to you, given all the suffering that you've endured, all the suffering that you're likely to go on enduring, and the resources that we have available to us? What are the possibilities we can achieve? And that's a lovely way, I think, to approach um, clinical encounters. Gavin, Javi, thank you. We, I'm, I'm actually going to take the chairs for kind of prerogative and duck the question for now, primarily because we have five minutes before we start taking in audience questions. And I'd like to, in that five minutes, especially as, it, Kevin, in your tweet promoting the event, um, you didn't shy from incorporating a political dimension to it. I'd like us together to think about the kind of society we live in, being permissive or otherwise of the kind of recovery that you describe as being stitched in to the whole business of being well and um, at some point recovering from illness or disease. D do you feel, both of you, um, in your in your closing comments perhaps, that we have a society that perhaps does prioritise achievement primarily over rest, treatment over care, um, pinstripe doctors over the necessity of nurses um, and if indeed those things are true, are they antithetical to the kind of recovery that you prize? And whose responsibility is it to fix the um, wrongness of that kind of culture, so to speak? Gavin, start, start with you, Gavin. Um, yes, um, do you know, when the welfare state started out, men had a life expectancy of 67 and it was expected that they would draw their pension for a couple of years and there was very little in the way of sickness benefits. I think as a society we now spend nine times more on sickness benefits than we did in the 40s but it's definitely not enough and our um, approach as a society to uh, almost the punishment of people who are um, unable to work is really quite shocking sometimes. I spend a lot of my time as my patient's advocate writing kind of supportive letters to the Department of Work and Pensions. So that's one element. I absolutely agree with you that we seem to have lost this 
this seemingly glaringly obvious fact that good nursing care is the most important thing in any recovery. And it's far easier for you as an oncologist, I'm sure, to get um, permission to prescribe very expensive new experimental chemos than it is to fund a few more um, nurses to, to better staff your oncology wards. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure most patients would very much like to see better nursing staff. And lastly, just mostly as a as a society more broadly, you know, we've we've half the number of hospital beds we have in our country from 1988. We've gone from 300,000 to 150,000. Um, hospital now, from my perspective as a GP, it seems to be kind of obsessed with discharging patients often before they're ready. And in the care of mental health, it's just we're in a truly heinous situation right now where there are so few mental health beds available in the area where I work that it is impossible for me to admit a patient to a hospital for humanitarian causes to relieve their suffering or their distress. The only admissible grounds for admission to psychiatric hospital are those of safety, either of the patient or of others. And I would love to see, and I'm sure all psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses would love to see far more bed numbers and a return to the the kind of that asylum aspect, um, which is asylum, the word connotes rest and safety and security. And, and we used to be able to offer that. We did it far too often and people are institutionalized badly, but we would, I would love to, to restore a bit of that to our society. Thank you, Gavin. Harvey, sorry, I'll have to ask you to be brief so we can get on to questions if I may. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just say one thing that, um, We've, we've talked about earlier, Gavin <clears throat> and Sam, that uh, makes me shudder like nothing else. So I'm on some um, sort of social uh, 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 media based groups for Lyme patients that are international. And I, I find nothing more chilling than the discussions amongst the US patients about, for example, inhalers, when they say, oh, I heard this inhaler is really good. But unfortunately, it's not covered for me. It'll be another $120 a month, I can't afford it. And I think that is just so chilling and such, um, you know, wrong on so many levels. And I think here in the UK, <clears throat> as a patient at least, I've always, rest, I've always rested easy knowing that, you know, this, this is not a consideration, this will not affect my care and I've seen it with you know family members I've seen it with other people I've seen but what I've also seen is health professionals doing more and more on less and less um, and I've seen people you know giving their devotion their care their compassion their extremely long hours for not very much money um, really struggling in the ways that Gavin is describing against uh, various edicts. So when you talk about societal changes, I think a, a big open conversation um, on uh, what happens next, what happens now that, you know, uh, COVID's here today and the NHS is, is, is pushed in various ways. Uh, is it time to rethink, you know, public funding? to increase it and you know I think that's that's one obvious point to make on this. Thanks Harvey. Both we, we ought to move to questions because the chat is just teeming with them. Um, so I'm gonna there's, there's too many unfortunately to, to pick all of them up but I first question I'd like to come to is how is recovery impacted on by inequalities? Gavin to you you must see that um, sharply. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's hugely dictated by your economic resources. It's dictated by your environment. I said at the beginning how important it was to be able to access a right kind of environment in terms of rest, quiet, light, greenery. Um, there's enormous disparities in our society about who can access those. So that's the first thing. The other thing is just in terms of work contracts. You know, we've had just a gentle slide towards uh, short term zero hours contracts and I have had many many patients who simply cannot afford to take any time off work and that has got worse 
over the 15 years that I've been a GP, it has been noticeably worse. And so um, there's enormous inequalities in terms of who can access the right kind of environment to recover. Thank you. Um, what's the role do you both feel of metaphor stories? Put a question close to my heart. Metaphor stories and poetry in recovery and indeed um, the role of philosophy. I should say, Harvey, that last bit was put in brackets, but we'll bring philosophy in as well. Just go ahead. Go ahead, Gavin. Uh, well, briefly for me, you know, story is absolutely fundamental in how people approach their illnesses. You know, I think most human beings understand the world through stories. And um, there's, there's a really striking... Um, disparity in somebody who can envisage their situation as part of a story that can tend towards a happy ending, that they can see a happy ending, and those who don't, who see themselves trapped in a particular kind of story that can only have a negative outcome, can only have a terrible ending. And it's related to that concept I spoke of earlier about the dynamism. If somebody is capable of seeing their body and their mind as a dynamic state, then it's possible for me to try and work with that and show them the ways in which their story might tend towards a happy ending. But people who are stuck in a very static view of their life and of their situation, it can be incredibly difficult to try and show them there are other options, there are other ways forward. And and But you have to work with the tools the patient has, you have to work with the worldview that they have. And so it can be very hard to work with a worldview that's ultimately very, very static and slowed down. Um, so I want to always try and find a more dynamic, more uplifting, more potential, potentially um, resolvable story for the patient that will help them understand their condition and how they might possibly get out of the situation they're in. So you're trying to find a story to help them find their story? Yeah, they're, I'm trying to nudge them towards a story that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. Harvey? As, as in the recip receiving end of um, more or less, I guess, empathetic or identifying clinicians? I think the importance of words um, as components of stories and narratives is, uh, is, is absolutely um, mm. e enormous. I think the words that you say, um, don't want to put you on the spot, but I think Sam, maybe more in, in the giving of diagnoses. Um, those words ought to be chosen carefully and pre-thought and given in uh, the, the correct situation. Um, <clears throat> and those words are words that stay with people for the rest of their lives and their families. So I think words are really important um, and a bit of a sales pitch for philosophy, and within that, concepts are really important. So a distinction like the distinction between disease and illness that I mentioned earlier allows us to see that there's two things going on. And as a physician talks to a patient, there could easily be miscommunication where the physician is talking about, I don't know, the molecular targets of this drug, and the patient is saying, uh, but I'm really upset because... I wanted to go abroad for my sister's wedding and I can't go. So how do we use words to to get back together to 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 find a shared reality that we can we can talk about fruitfully in the clinic? Yeah, thanks so much for that. I you know, I couldn't agree more. They the, they have such huge force, don't they, and impact on the experience of illness and indeed therefore recovery all of it. The whole the whole run those there's a question here about um, schizophrenia um, and the need for continued um, lifelong care and caregivers and the, and, and, and the value of that. Gavin, you talk about caregivers in, in the book and carers more generally. Again, uh, an entity that's so devalued in um, the contemporary world of certainly the NHS, but I think more widely in medicine, certainly in high and middle income countries. No, absolutely. The, I think most of us have got a memory of being a small child, being cared for, that, that sense of being made safe, 
being um, nourished, being um, surrounded by a kind of warmth and protection. And of course, for so many people, that is an experience of adulthood too. It's not confined to childhood. Um, and what I wanted to do in the book was not only point out the massive contribution, I mean, contribution is the wrong word, um, the impossibility of really us functioning as a society without the vast amounts of unpaid caring work that goes on that people are doing, um, but also at the same time, gently, tentatively point out to those of us who are being cared for to try and remember the needs and the frustrations of our carers, which can be really intense, extreme. One thing that was really obvious to me during the pandemic lockdowns was that when all the respite care went and suddenly people couldn't access respite care, the absolutely horrendous outcomes that started to evolve and develop because we need these kinds of respite care. People who are unpaid carers do it do their work for love, they look to after their loved ones for love, but they need actual breaks too in order to be able to go on doing what they do. And um, I wanted to put in this book a little mention of how vital that work is, but also a little reminder of that we need to look after the carers a lot better than we do and not shut down all respite if this ever happens again. Yes, thank you for that. It's just so salutary that a uh, worldwide pandemic garnered such heightened attention on you know shiny ventilators above all else um rather than wider aspects of our response to you know suffering and death yeah we, uh, so sorry kevin briefly you know just the effects of course you know i saw huge deteriorations in my patients that are living with dementia mm. they weren't getting the kind of stimulation they got from their day centers and clubs huge care stress on the people that were living with those patients. And at the other end of the scale, kids with special needs, when their day centres were closed down, um, home situations, family situations completely breaking down mm. because these centres were to cater for the kid with special needs, but they were also to provide some kind of opportunity for the parents to be able to cope with the rest of their life. Um, and that was all shut down. So very difficult time. Thank you. Javi, there's an interesting question here asking you to elaborate a bit more about what you mean by uh, recovery holding a moral dimension to it. Yeah. So I think the labour of being ill and the labour of recovery and more than anything, the labour of dying are perhaps moral peaks, if you like in terms of the demands placed on us, the, the stress of somebody who is, um, you know, in the final stages of dying and the stress on the people who are close to them and, and watch them is inconceivable. And I think it brings out forms of virtue that are not really, um, similar or on, on the same level as day-to-day -day virtue. So you could say, yes, you have to be courageous before you, I don't know, get a tooth pulled out. And you, you, we say to our children, uh, you need to be compassionate. If somebody falls over, you help them up. But the types of courage and the types of compassion that are required in these extreme end of life points are, I think, on a different level. And we don't have words for sort of you know courage squared um and and i think we need to be more attuned to the fact that we use leveling words to describe courage across the board but the courage of a dying person and the courage of a, a, a child with a learning disability um setting foot on their way to their first day in a in a big um, comprehensive school is, I think, of a, of a different magnitude. And um, in my work, I'm very interested in being able to express the relativity of our concepts and how we ought to celebrate and acknowledge that at times of very limited physical ability, 
and perhaps uh, you mentioned dementia, Gavin, cognitive ability, we can still see virtues, we can still see forms of flourishing, if you like, of excellence uh, that we ought to really pay much more attention to. Thank you, Marie. Um, it is sadly eight o'clock, um, both um, everyone. Um, Firstly, you know, I'm sorry that the, the 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 connection has sometimes been fragile, but in a way, uh, that's speaking to the fact we are articulating fragility, and the fact that through that there is um, the right language, um, gratitude, um, and recovery stitched into not just illness but the entire day-to-day -day business of health. Um, I'd like to thank um, deeply. Um, Harvey Carell and Gavin Francis for their, their books, their messages, and for our conversation uh, tonight, two remarkable and important uh, people. Harvey and Gavin, thank you very much, and thank you to the welcome. And thank you to all of you for uh, listening and engaging as you have. Good evening.